This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and welcome to our weekly show, Condo Insider. As I've said many times before, about 38% of our population lives in some form of an association. And Condo Insider is all about association living, trying to help board members and owners alike understand how that all works. Some of you may have missed me. I've been on vacation and or had a little medical procedure, nothing to worry about along the way. That's the hat. And I want to thank Jane Sugimura for her weeks of covering for me while I was recovering and or traveling and, and enjoying life. Today we have a really fascinating guest on a story that hit the papers and a news story that has significant implications for associations and there's many lessons to be learned. Just to give you a little footnote, the headline in the Star Advertiser said, Jury sides with couple in 1.9 million disability discrimination lawsuit. And this was against a Maui condominium association. The actual numbers are that the association got a judgment against it for $1,765,300 plus fees and costs of another approximately $487,000 for a total judgment of $2,252,000. So I've invited Eric career here, the plaintiff's attorney who started down this road to <laughs> help defend these uh, poor homeowners. And welcome to the show, Eric. And Thank you. And it's a pleasure to be here. Tell me a little bit about uh, you and how long you've been in Hawaii and, and what you do. Okay. Well, I am an attorney. I've been an attorney for 36 years. And I originally came from New York. You might hear it in my voice from time to time and uh, moved out to Southern California, attended UCLA Law School. And uh, after I went to law school, I decided I would go back to New York. It was the hottest summer that I can ever remember. I said, I'm getting out of here. And I went back to Los Angeles and uh, joined uh, Johnny Cochran's firm and worked with Johnny for 21 years until he passed. And uh, 1997, I moved to Hawaii, had been uh, living uh, visiting Hawaii for 10 years and I said I should stop visiting and live here. Moved to Maui and I've been living in Haiku, Maui ever since. So you moved to Hawaii in 1997? Yeah. So you've been here, how many years is that? 21 years. 21 years. Yeah. Did you love it? Oh my gosh, I wouldn't live anywhere else. Yeah, I yeah. understand that. <laughs> well, you know, this case, you know, I'm in the industry here, so I just find it bizarre and I've got a chance to talk with you earlier about this case, the road it took. But why don't you just tell us, in simple terms, kind of an overview generally what the case was about. Well, um, I represented Gregory and Michelle White. Gregory uh, has been blind in his left eye uh, his entire life, um, had a condition that affected also his right eye, but he could see pretty well out of that eye. But as he got older, um, he continued to have problems, particularly in, in the dark. Um, he stopped driving at night. And that was a particular problem in his uh, condominium unit um, because when it got dark and uh, he only had artificial light, he couldn't see very well. And he started tripping over the carpet on his second floor unit in the condominium complex. And the condo had a house rule that said you couldn't have anything but carpeting on the second floor unit. So they started investigating, you know, what would help him with this situation. They found that a hardwood floor would work well for him. And uh, even though there was this rule, they knew that there was any number of people in the condominium complex that had wood floors, including two board members. So let me stop you there. So here you have a condo, and they have a rule. It's probably been there forever. No hardwood floors on the second floor, probably because of noise. Yes. And meanwhile, over the life of this condo, they allowed other people to have hardwood floors, and two board members had hardwood floors, and so he put in a hardwood floor. So what's the problem? Well, it's interesting. Uh, <laughs> he put, it took about two and a half months, to, at $16,000 to put this floor in. The whole board knew about it. No one complained except one person, the person downstairs, and not to the whites, to the board. He was complaining to the board for weeks, if not months. But they still never came to the whites and said, well, what are you doing here? 
So the, the floor goes in, and now the downstairs neighbor gets a lawyer. And she writes the board and says, I'm going to sue everybody. I'm going to sue uh, the guy, the board member with the wood floor, the president, the whole board, the whites. And three weeks after that, the board finally writes a letter to the whites and says, oh, took you two and a half months to put it in. Rip it out in two weeks. But, but typically from my, and I know, I know nothing, just so you know. But typically from my experience, when we've had other people have installed hardwood floors, did this floor have like a cushioning between the wood? It did. It? it did. And they specifically made sure that they did that. And then the next question is, typically when we have that problem, we send someone, and even sometimes get some acoustical equipment, to see. Because, you know, living in a condo, I had a case with a retirement home up in uh, Mililani where the owner was complaining about the noise transmitting of the door cabinets closing and the toilet flushing. And did they do a hand to, to check the validity of this person's complaint? Well, they did, as a matter of fact. They sent the, the board member with the wood floor. By the way, he never told the board that he had a wood floor while all this was going on. They sent him over to see if there really was noise. And he goes over there twice, listens, and all he hears is water you know, on the sink and a door closing, and he hears no noise from the wood floor. He runs back to the condo and he says, I don't hear any noise. So there was no evidence. And in fact, at the trial, there was no evidence there actually was noise coming from this floor. Now, when the owner put the wood floor in, did he talk to the board or respond to any, any letters? Or what did he, I mean, he obviously, it strikes me that he would have said something to somebody about the wood. I want to put a wood floor oh, in. Oh, absolutely. First, he asked the, per, the board member that put the wood floor in, did you have to get permission to put the board, the floor in? He said no. Then they call up the president. And they asked the president, you know, can we get an exception to this rule? And he says, well, we don't really enforce that rule. We only, you know, do something if, in fact, there's a complaint. So they thought they could put the floor in. They have board members, other residents that have wood floors on the second floor. They thought they could do it. Did any, do you know offhand of the other units that had wood floors, did any residents living under them ever complain about the wood floors? I think that some of them did. I think there were some legitimate complaints. But that's the interesting thing. It was never really a legitimate complaint with respect to my clients at condominium unit. Well, your issue is a little bit unique in the sense that, um, and you know, the civil rights laws, discrimination laws, are very strict about what you can say and what you can't say, you know, as far as what a board can ask or not ask. So you have uh, your client who's saying, well, I need to have a wooden floor because of my poor eyesight. And by the way, I never mentioned this to you. I have poor eyesight. I'm blind to my right eye, oh, okay. but I was blind from birth, mm -hmm. so it's not something that can be corrected. I just have to learn how to maneuver in dark lights and those types of things. So I have empathy for his problem, mm -hmm. because it's mm -hmm. probably worse than mine, to be honest with you. But did he ever tell them that I'm disabled or I, 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 have, a, or I have a medical condition that requires this? Or? And eventually he did, but one of the problems that they had right from the outset is after this two-week period passes and they don't have enough time to, to remove the floors or do anything for that matter, the board, in violation of their, uh, their, their bylaws, starts fining the whites $200 a day. And so all of a sudden they're hitting with, hit with these fines. They know that all these other people have wood floors and they hire an attorney to see if he can work something out and just be really treated like everybody else in the condominium unit. And that went nowhere. Tell me a little more what the bylaw said. The bylaw has this provision, and it's really kind of a due process provision. They call it procedural safeguards. And it essentially says that before you can levy a fine against any homeowner, you have to basically have a hearing with three people, competent people, and you get a chance to put on evidence, you get a chance to cross-examine witness, you get a chance to call your own witnesses. And that has to happen before any fine is issued. And this case... There were 850 fines issued, and these folks were never afforded a hearing. I know I have bad hearing because I'm, I'm old. Did you say 850 fines issued? Yes, it's worth repeating that. 850 fines, and they weren't $10 fines. They were $200 fines. And just to keep this in perspective, these folks' maintenance fees were about $573. So after three days, their maintenance fees are used up. That's... That gets into another issue that's really kind of a bad situation that this association did with respect to these people. 
Yeah, what that is is, a, and just for to remind our viewing audience, there used to be until July 1 of this year, uh, what they call priority of payment, where in fact, if you had a balance due like to a fine, when you made a payment as a homeowner, the board could, at its, its discretion, apply it to the way they wanted. So in the old days, they would apply it to the fine, leaving you unpaid maintenance fees, and then they would theoretically foreclose you. Don't tell me they tried to foreclose on these poor people. That's exactly what they did. They basically misappropriated these people's uh, maintenance fees to pay illegal fines and attorney fees, and then they claimed that these folks were in arrears. And they actually told everybody about that. That was publicized to the 140 units there, that they were actually in arrears, and they never were. They paid their maintenance fees every month. That seems to be a violation of the Basic Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. To it is. credit information. That's right. That's right. I mean, we would tell our clients never to do that yeah. because uh, it's risky. Yeah. So, yeah. so anyway, so, so you're telling me they find them 850 dot fines for about 170000 plus dollars. That's correct. They took the maintenance fees they paid and applied it to the fines. And, of course, you could never, ever have enough money to pay off these fines at $200 a day. And then... You're telling me they actually went to and tried to do a foreclosure. That's right. And even before the foreclosure, my clients notified them in writing that Gregory had a disability. They said, we'd like a reasonable accommodation in the form of an exception to this second floor rule. It took the president of the association 23 minutes to make a decision. And the decision was made on the basis of the fact that my client walks his dog around the property and lives on the second story. And there was no analysis, there was no reach out to my client. They refused to sit down. And in fact, they had their attorney write my client saying, we won't even talk to you about this reasonable accommodation until you pay $30,000. That was what was, they claimed was due a bit at that point. So they had to pay $30,000 just to sit down with uh, the board and talk about this. And of course, they didn't have the money, so they couldn't sit down. And then the, their attorney continued to threaten them and say, we're going to foreclose. And ultimately, after they got me involved, I started sending letters to these folks and saying, what are you doing here? You're violating the law. And they just wouldn't listen. See, I want to say something probably impolite. Like, are they on drugs? <laughs> but instead, we're going to take a one-minute break, and we'll be right back with Condo Insider in a minute. Okay. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. I'm getting older. Do I need to worry about falling? Yes, you do. Each year, one in four people 65 and older will experience a fall, and many will be serious. The majority of falls happen at home, so remove things that could make you trip and install handrails to keep you steady. To learn more about the steps you can take to help prevent a fall, please talk to your doctor. You can also visit aarpfoundation.org or medicaremadeclear.com slash falls. This message was brought to you by United Healthcare and AARP Foundation. Hello everyone, I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. We're back with Eric Ferrier talking about the big judgment of over $2 million against the Maui Condo Association for Discrimination. And before we took the break, I kind of made an offhand comment that here they find this owner for wood floors allegedly in violation of their documents, didn't comply with the bylaws to give them a hearing, and they find them a little bit more than once, like 850 times for a total of $170,000, and then said, well, we're gonna take your maintenance fees and apply that to the fines. And so you're delinquent your maintenance fees and we're gonna foreclose. And if you want a hearing, you gotta pay me $30,000 first. Is that a pretty good summary? That, that's a good summary, yes. You know? So what happened next? Well, after I wrote a letter to the, the attorney for the board and I said, look, you know, you're violating the law. Um, he wouldn't do anything, so we filed a Hawaii civil rights complaint. Figured that might get their attention. They still didn't do anything. In December of 2014, I wrote another letter and said, look, stop the fines, postpone the foreclosure, 
let's sit down, let's talk about this, because if you don't do so, there's going to come a day when I'm going to be before a jury and I'm going to tell them what you did to these folks. They still didn't do anything. So January 6 at noontime, 2015 was the date for the sale. We had no choice. We had to file the complaint and we filed it the day before. And I showed up on the courtroom steps to see if they were crazy enough to go forward with this um, foreclosure. They postponed the foreclosure, but they still were kind of crazy because what they did after that, that was at, up to that point there were 277 fines. After that, they issued another 573 fines. And the only reason they stopped is I took the deposition of the president and I put the uh, bylaws in front of him and I said, did you do any of these things? these procedural safeguards that you're supposed to do before you find these folks. And he said, no. And I asked him, well, why didn't you do that? And he said, I have no information about that. Nine days later, they stopped the fine. But they didn't forgive the fines at that point. Well, you know, I'm, I've been around the block a lot. I've been in this industry 25 years. I hate to use the word outrageous, but this conduct is outrageous in the sense it doesn't seem that the board have much respect for the rights of the individual owner. And certainly, when it comes to a disabled owner, they have a lot of rights under the federal law, uh, of rights of what we call accommodation. You know, and where do you feel the disconnect happened? I mean, they seem to be going down this road regardless of the outcome. I feel like almost, I, uh, I'm a student of military history, I'm thinking July 2nd, 1863, when General Lee didn't listen to all of his generals and sent William Pickett across the wheat field in Gettysburg, where in two hours, 12,000 soldiers were killed or wounded. It's like, what were they thinking? You know, that, that's a question that I've been asking for four years. Before the trial of this case, I did, you know, focus groups informally with everybody that I know. And I would tell them as fairly as possible the fact scenario that you just heard, which still there's some more facts that you haven't heard yet. Um, and, and they would say, these folks are crazy to go to trial. This, they're not going to win this case. So I was asking that question, but I want to tell you about one other thing. I want to hear it. OK. So um, after I took the deposition of, of the president and they stopped the fines, I guess they had to figure out what, how they were going to characterize the fines and what they were going to do about this, because they were illegal. About eight months later, they came up with the solution, they thought, and they created this document they called a resolution. And you start reading through it and you think, oh, this is good. They're going to forgive the fines and they're going to not foreclose and it's, everything's going to be all right until you get to the last paragraph. The last paragraph of that document said, everything above is conditioned on one of two things. You either dismiss this case with prejudice. Now, that means you give up your rights. So what they were doing was they were leveraging their illegal fines to make these folks give up a civil right. That's unlawful. That, that's just wrong. Or you go to trial. You keep on spending all these thousands of dollars on your attorneys, and we're not going to decide whether or not you should get this reasonable accommodation. We're going to let the jury decide that. So what they were doing was saying, we're not going to do our job. We're going to make the jury do our job for us, and we're going to make you pay all the attorney fees necessary for you to get there. And I want you to know that at that time, my client was recovering from heart surgery. And they had spent all their money on this case. They were broke. Their life savings was gone. So they didn't say in that, quote, settlement offer, for lack of a better word, they didn't say, we're going to grant you the reasonable accommodation. They just basically said, we'll waive the fines and stop the foreclosure. They didn't admit that he was entitled to a reasonable That's accommodation. Right. That's right. And then they were saying, even though he violated, theoretically, your civil rights, um, Ignore that. We, we're going to make you give up all your rights to have your civil rights enforced because if you accept this, you have to drop all these rights. That's right. Now, this must be a hardship on your client. I mean, it must have cost they, them a fortune. You know, I, I have the ultimate respect for them. You know, anybody that goes through this and they spend all their money and they're at their wit's end, um, it, it's, it's unimaginable. It's like I, I told the jury, it's like 850 cuts and then beyond because they kept on oppressing these people, making them think that they were going to lose their home. And so it got to the point where they couldn't pay their attorney fees anymore. And the question for us and them was whether we were going to let this go and let this rogue homeowners association get away with this, or we were going to continue the fight. And so we agreed to uh, continue the fight on a contingency fee basis. 
and ultimately we got justice for them. Well, you know, it's, I would have to tell you, I've been in industry, as I said, a long time. I don't think this case is representative of the industry on a normal course of event. I think most boards are much more diligent. Uh, the, the things that come to mind when I hear this story is, uh, you know, board members are volunteers, right? They, they probably rely on professionals. So I would assume they would have been relying on their management company and or their counsel on this matter, which leads me to believe that you better make sure you have a good management company and good counsel because you could be led down the wrong road if you, if you just kind of gloss this over and think because you're a board that, that you have some indefinite power that you can do to do these kinds of things. I, I think that's absolutely true. Having competent counsel in a management company is essential. And, and the thing to keep in mind for all homeowners association is the fact that you have an attorney who knows everything about the condo laws is not good enough in this situation because this case was not governed by condo law. It was governed by discrimination law, the FHA and HRS 515. And the requirements under those sections is different from anything else. And if you don't have an attorney that knows that, they can run afoul of those laws and uh, a large judgment like this uh, they can be subject to. And rightfully so. You know, I've had many uh, uh, guests on the show here. We say, look, we need to respect the rights of the disabled. And we need to find ways to help them enjoy their life and accommodate them so they can enjoy their home. And sometimes that may require some sacrifices. Uh, I think we talked earlier about putting a ramp in for common elements, uh, making allowances to allow wood floors and other types of things. It's just part of the law, A, but it's just part of aloha and common sense yeah. and dignity to be able to preserve the rights of, of the disabled. But quickly going along, what is, you, you got the judgment, you got the money yet? Not yet. Um, so the defendant has filed what I would characterize as a frivolous uh, notice of appeal. I looked at the issues. I've been involved in this case in four years. I know the rulings that the judge made. They all were appropriate. So. Uh, they filed a notice of appeal, presumably to preserve their rights, um, but it's not going anywhere. And, and one of the things I, I hope they don't do is compound a number of mistakes that they've made over four years with one more significant one. Interest is accruing on this judgment every single day. I think it's something like over $600 a day. Um, if they lose this appeal, they're going to have be responsible for that. They're going to be responsible for attorney fees and costs. And so... You know, there comes a time when you just have to, you know, man up, if you will, or woman up, if you will, and say, we were wrong about this. Let's try to make this right. And, and I hope that they're in that frame of mind. We have a, a mediation coming up, and we'll see what happens. But uh, Was there insurance coming involved in this? Did they have insurance for this? They, they have plenty of insurance. There's issues about that, but they have plenty of insurance. Yeah, I think you were telling me in the break that, heaven forbid, that they noticed one of their insurance carriers, but the other insurance carrier, they never told them about the claim in the first place. It may very well be that. I don't know all the facts. I'll find out more in mediation. All I do know is that, you know, they send out sheets that show all the coverage that they have. And I can tell you that that coverage, if it's properly used, is more than enough to pay this judgment. So we'll see what happens. And I guess my message to our audience is, is that if you have a claim, whether right or wrong, make sure you talk to your insurance agent and submit it to all the carriers that may provide some form of coverage. If you don't, you potentially didn't give the notice of the claim and you could put in jeopardy the insurance coverage. I'm not an expert on insurance because there's all this right to defend issues and all these other things, but the common industry practice is if you have a claim, tell all your insurance companies so you're adequately protected case something goes south, which this went deep south. That's for sure. You know? What, kind of, what are the takeaways you have from, the, how, how, the case went over four years, right? Four years. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I think it, it's, it's really common sense. It really is. It, it's not rocket science. But the first takeaway is that boards um, need to read understand and follow their bylaws. If that happened in this case, you can almost foresee what would happen. They would have had a hearing way back at the end of 2013 or the beginning of 2014. And that would have given an opportunity for everybody, all the stakeholders, 
to talk about what was going on here. And they could have resolved this right then and there. And the same thing with their non-discrimination policy. You need to read, um, understand, and follow your non-discrimination policy. It required an investigation. An investigation doesn't occur when you have 23 minutes, you make a decision in 23 minutes and never talk to the disabled individual. They never talk to my client. So you gotta at least do those two things. But in addition to that, the evidence in this case showed that they had medical records that demonstrated that my client was disabled. So it wasn't just their word. It wasn't just my word. It was their doctor's word. They acted like they never got it, and we proved that they had it early on in this matter. And finally, you, you need to have competent counsel. And, and by that I mean you need to have somebody that understands the legal issues in this particular case, not generally in condo cases, but if you've got a dis disability case, a discrimination claim, they need to know the law with respect to that. And even if you know, the board just wasn't that in tune to all of this, if they had used the current statute that provides for a value to mediation before a retired judge, cost of $175 a party, they would have had a chance to at least try an initial mediation with a retired judge where the judge can actually express himself on the issues and potentially resolve it before this got to be a 400,000 plus fees and costs in addition to the damages, you know, the, the, the 1.7 million, you know. That's right. Communication is key. And you, you can't just use your lawyer as, uh, you know, something to separate you from your owners. You need to have that relationship with the owners. And um, so you need to talk. And communication, whether it be by way of mediation or directly, and if directly it doesn't work out, get the mediation, um, you know, it, it's almost free, you know, when you think about what mediations cost to stay. So it's, it's absolutely no reason to not avail of someone, yourself of that. that well, measure. let me congratulate you on Thank you. Uh, what I call taking care of uh, some poor, unfortunate owners. I think the, the verdict itself and your story t tells you what happened here. Mm -hmm. And let me tell our board members out there and owners, remind you, we have a value to mediation when there are disputes like this. But when it comes to the rights of the disabled, it goes beyond the condo law and even what your documents may say. They have rights of reasonable accommodation, and you need to approach that intelligently and fairly to try to help people who truly deserve help, because if they're disabled, they're trying to make the best of their life. So I want to wish all of you a happy holiday. Jane's going to be here next year, next week. And uh, thank you for watching Condo Insider. And again, Eric, thank you for being on the show. Thank you.